Dr. Colin Fuller was raised in New England. As a senior at Bates, he was president of the Bates Outing Club. He attended Tufts University School of Medicine, obtained further medical residency training at UC Davis in Sacramento, California, and pursued a cardiology fellowship with Dr. DeBakey in Houston, Texas. He practiced interventional cardiology in Reno, Nevada for almost 40 years. He recently retired to enjoy more family time, and I, I will tell you that he is leaving today for a journey hike on Mount Whitney with 10 of his family members, including his children and grandchildren. He has continued volunteer work as a sports cardiologist team physician for the University of Nevada at Reno. High altitude physiology and medicine is a keen inter interest of his. His present leisure activities include snow skiing, biking, running, sailing, mountain climbing, and hiking. I consider Colin to be a friend. I have sat with he and his wife, Robin, in their living room, and he has shared many stories with me about his um, Bates career. I think we're all very lucky to be hearing um, from him today, and I'm so excited to introduce Dr. Colin Fuller. Thank you, Erin. Um, title of my talk is, uh, I may start off by saying thank you to you, Erin, and Stephanie, and Jen for your wonderful organizational organization of this talk and other talks. I think the talks are very interesting and diverse. So thank you very much for your help. Uh, my title of my talk is Bates Outing Club BOC inspired mountain climbs around the world, including a sense of the highest peak in each continent, celebrating the BOC centennial. To me, the Bates Outing Club represents service to community, enhanced love of the outdoors, teamwork, development of risk management principles, and adventure. The objective of this slide video presentation is to entertain, educate, and honor the Bates Outing Club. I've had the privilege to visit far-reaching corners of all continents while pursuing climbs of high mountains. My interest in climbing mountains was nurtured at Bates. Skills such as teamwork and risk management, which made my trip safe and successful, were developed while serving on the BOC Council. In 1973, after four years at Tufts University School of Medicine, I moved out west, partly for higher mountains. I had the exhilaration of climbing Mount Shasta, a little over 14,000 feet, in the winter in Northern California in the Cascade Mountain Range, an old stratovolcano which last erupted in 1776 and is still potentially active. I also enjoyed the excitement of climbing Mount Whitney at 14.5 in the Sierra Nevada range in Southern California. Next up was Denali at 20,310. In Alaska, Denali in Koyukon means great one. It was first ascended in 1913. I flew from Sacramento to uh, Anchorage and I took the Alaska Railroad up to Talkeetna, the origin for small airplane flights to Denali's glaciers. There I met our guide, Ray Janae, a man with an infectious personality who was a legend larger than life. Why was he a legend larger than life? Because in the winter of 1967, over 42 days, Ray Janae and his team battled terrifying winds, massive snowfall, and brutal temperatures to reach the summit of Denali. There's a book written about it called Minus 148 Degrees. There I learned from Ray and others about a Jumar it's, which is a clamp with a handle that can move freely up a rope on which it is clipped, but locks when downward pressure is applied. It can be a lifesaver. Late June of 1975, you crammed our supplies and ourselves into the single engine turboprop and flew 100 miles to the base of Denali. We landed on the southeast fork of the Cahilton Glacier at 7,000 foot elevation. We unloaded our plane. During our first evening on the mountain with many hours of light, we moved our gear to our next higher elevation campsite and then returned to sleep at a lower elevation to reduce the risk of altitude sickness. We are taking the Cahilna Glacier up from 7,000 feet up to 14.4, shown here over four days. Then we'll send the West Buttress, this is the West Buttress here, to 16,000, and then eventually move our camp up to 17.2, then move the camp up to 18.2 at Denali Pass, and then up to the summit. This is a typical camp. 
The views were awesome. We have to four days of good weather reached our camp at 14.4 before ascending the west buttress. We're gonna send this snow ice ramp here to get to the top of the west buttress up there. Here we are ascending with Jumars attached to the fixed rope up the steep side of the west buttress. This is atop the west buttress at 16,000 as evening approached, moisture was in the air. This was our view of our 14 floor campsite from the west buttress. Note the visible crevasses here and our camp, prior camp was here. If they're visible crevasses, that means nearby there are invisible crevasses. The fellow, these are our fellow climbers, uh, three of our fellow climbers, the two on the left were engaged. That night tragedy struck at 16,000. Overnight, the engaged man developed a severe headache. By morning, he was almost comatose. Our rescue descent in the storm was ultimately unsuccessful. In response, I desert, decided to learn more about acute mountain sickness. This is an article in the Wilderness Medical Society uh, uh, entitled Clinical Practice Guidelines for the Prevention and Treatment of Acute Illness, Acute Altitude Illness in 2019. This is the reference here. I'm not gonna delve into this too deeply, but I'm gonna cover it quickly so you're at least familiar with the terms. AMS is acute mouth sickness. HACE is high altitude cerebral edema. They're two entities of a spectrum of illness affecting the brain from lack of oxygen in your blood at higher elevations. The setting is generally rapid ascent of unacclimatized persons to over 8,000 feet from altitudes below 5,000 feet. The pathophysiology is brain edema secondary to, to low oxygen tension in your blood. The symptoms of mountain sickness, the mild symptoms are headache relieved by acetaminophen or ibuprofen. Moderate symptoms is unrelieved headache and unrelieved headache, the only way to really treat it is to go down. Severe is altered consciousness. Uh, that's I think what happened to our, our colleague who unfortunately died. The instance on, on McKinley of AMS, acute mouth sickness is 30%, means almost one out of three people get uh, acute mouth sickness as headache, lack of appetite, weakness, nausea. And it, it goes away in a few days if you don't ascend any further. HAPE and HACE, about two or 3% of climbers in McKinley get that. HAPE is high to do pulmonary edema. And we'll talk about that shortly. The, the unread is the only thing I'll say about risk for high altitude, altitude mountain sick, acute mountain sickness uh, uh, on mountains. If you're climbing over 10,000 feet, you don't want, you want to send your climbing, your sleeping elevation, you don't want to move it up more than 1,500 feet per day on average. That's a key, that's a key number to keep in mind, that 1,500 feet when you're ascending over 10,000 feet as you might be if you're doing uh, climbing in South America, Asia, Europe, or out West. That's the wrong way. Prevention of AMS and HACE, gradual ascent, two medicines, acetazolamide and dexamethasone. Oops, wrong way. Treatment, descent, anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 feet will relieve symptoms, supplemental oxygen, Keep your oxygen saturation greater than 90%. Portable hyperbaric chamber, Gamoff bag. Uh, we have Gamoff bags in, we have one on Everest. It's, it's, and it was on, we have it uh, it's in Kilimanjaro and other high peaks around the world where there are many people are climbing. I'll show you one shortly. Acetazolamide and dexamethasone are not only good for prevention, but also treatment. And then acetaminophen and ibuprofen for headache. This is a Gamoff bag here. Used, we, this, this is used at uh, 21 5 on Everest at our advanced base. One of the climbers up high developed high altitude pulmonary edema. And we placed him in this tube in which we have, there's a, a pump you, with you pump up the pedal with your foot. And that generates more pressure in the tube like blowing up a balloon. More 
pressure in the tube is kind of like, is like higher atmospheric pressure. Higher atmospheric pressure is like dropping down from where you are. The main symptom of acute high altitude tube pulmonary edema is shortness of breath at rest. So if you're short of breath at rest, that's, that is very unusual when you're climbing. We're all short of breath when we're moving with climbing, but at rest, that's a, uh, um, a uh, not how it should be. Prevention in susceptible individuals, those who have had hate before are susceptible. Gradual ascent is the, is the way to prevent it. Medicines, nifedipine, tadalafil, and dexamethasone are also good for prevention. This is the treatment, is descent, as we mentioned before, supplemental oxygen, keep oxygen saturation greater than 90%, hyperbaric chamber, as we, I've just shown you, and nifedipine. Sequelae take about a week to subside. Uh, there are no chronic sequelae in the lungs to circulation, as far as we know. Reascent usually leads to hape again. So if you had it once and you go high again, you'll probably get it again. After we called a team in to transport the body back to Taukina, we moved our camp towards the summit of Denali from 16,000 to 17,500 with 60 pound packs as some of us were on a traverse of Denali. At 17,500, we had a three day heavy wind storm with winds over 50 miles per hour. You notice here, we built a protective snow wall around the camp, which made a big difference. We built an igloo for another team whose tent was demolished by the high winds. They unfortunately had not built a snow wall around their tent. Igloo was ready for the other climbing team whose tent had been demolished by the high winds. We were gonna leave here. We didn't wanna leave them without a shelter. So now they had a bomb-proof shelter. We made an attempt for the summit, was unsuccessful due to high winds. So therefore we moved our camp up here to Denali Pass. The summit is up off to the high right. And from that location, we can stage another summit attempt. This is our camp at Denali Pass. You know, the large uh, snow walls around our tents. This is the summit pyramid. And this is the summit of Denali. At 20,310, July of 1975, a Batesy six years after graduation with a base outing club pennant. There are awesome views from the highest point in North America. Some of us are doing a traverse, and we're going to, this is the north side. We're going on the ascent, it was up the southwest side. This is the north side here. This is the Harper Glacier up here. This is the Cl Harper Icefall. And on the other side of this ridge is the Modro Glacier, which is our destination. Now we're below, this is a shot of the Harper Icefall from below. You can see you have to skirt around that. We were able to, on the left side, looking up, going down Karsten Ridge. It's the way we skirted that, that's about, three or 4,000 vertical feet there. This is on the descent of Karsten Ridge around the Harper Icefall with Muldrow Glacier below us. This is Muldrow Glacier with a, at sunset. I think sunsets in the world are always beautiful. I have a question about this fellow here with the white headband. Is he filling his water bottle upstream or downstream from us? <laughs> we finally had time for foot care. These pretty flowers were our first sign of vegetation in nearly a month. Between us and a road where civilization was 20 miles of Alaskan tundra, we were nearly out of food. For the next two days at noontime, we ate what we called Denali delights. We had leftover salami and cheese. So he fried it up and ate it. It was delicious, but not very filling. 
Oops, sorry. Mosquitoes were overwhelming. Uh, this is the McKinley River, which I felt was uh, the most risky part of the trip due to traversing very cold, fast flowing water up to mid thigh of 400 yards at 2 a.m. Why 2 a.m.? Because that's when we felt the water level would be lowest. This is before crossing, oops, sorry, before crossing. And this is the McKinley River, it's quite wide. And this is after crossing at four in the morning with a bonfire to get us warmer. Finally, we were in Anchorage having our first meal in several days. It was a somber celebration of our summiting. So in Denali in 1975, what life lesson did I learn? SHIT can happen, be prepared for it. Two years later, uh, some friends and I from Sacramento, they became lifelong friends. They were Bob Carlson, and Paul Richens. We decided to do Mount Logan in the Yukon in 1977. Highest peak in Canada was first climbed in 1925. We were flown in 80 miles from Haines Junction, Yukon, to the 8,000 foot elevation King Trench on Mount Logan. We are slowly grinding our way up the King Trench on Mount Logan. I had the sudden discovery or previously non-apparent crevasse. The ropes fortunately held me 20 feet into the crevasse. Even at a depth, I could not see the bottom. This is a picture looking up at the hole I'd made in the snow bridge covering the hidden crevasse. This is why you're roped together on glaciers. We moved up slowly to avoid altitude sickness. We cooked outside when the weather allowed. This, after, after a week of good weather, we were at the summit pyramid, summit of Mount Logan at 195 in 1977. Life lesson on Logan in 1977, second chances are good, have one. If I had not been roped, I'd still be in that crevasse now. We stuck, then uh, the next two years, as Aaron pointed out, I went down to Houston to train with Dr. DeBakey in cardiology at Methodist Hospital associated with Baylor College of Medicine. And then the first two years of the 80s, I moved to Reno to start a practice. I was too busy in all those years to climb. But finally, in 1982, a friend called and said, how about doing Mustagata in China? And first, in, first I said in 1956, my response was absolutely. I always wanted to visit China. It was a worthwhile, it was in retrospect, a worthwhile experience. Not only the climb, but visiting the country of China at that time. And China had been a closed country since Mao took over in the late 1940s. Mao died in 1976, ending the Cultural Revolution. Deng Xiaoping in 1978 opened up China to foreign business and travel, but it didn't open up the far western part of China, Xinjiang uh, uh, province uh, area of, of, of China. And the reason we got there is we applied to the Chinese Mandarin Association. They gave us a permit. So we flew to Beijing, onto Urimchi, and then on to Kashgar in the, this area in this red rectangle nestled in very, amongst very high mountains, the Soviet and Chinese Pamirs in Nukush, Karakoram Range with K2, second highest peak in the world, and the Himalayas, of course, with Mount Everest. This is a, this is that red, whoops, sorry. This is that red rectangle. And uh, this is Kashgar we flew into. And this is moved out about 100 miles that the crow flies away. Uh, this was in Xinjiang like Tibet is an autonomous region of China. This is the Xinjiang region of Tibet, uh, of China. Population of Xinjiang is 28.5 million. It's approximately three times the size of France. Predominantly Muslim people. Part of the Karakoram Highway goes through Xinjiang. Kashgar, 
has a population today of over 500,000 and has served historically as a trading post and strategically important city on the Silk Road between China, the Middle East, and Europe for over 2,000 years. This is some shots of around Kashgar. There's a local mosque. And at this point, very few, these people in Kashgar had seen very few Westerners. <clears throat> and so we were, we were privileged to be there. And uh, we were, indeed, it was a pleasure to be there. This area was untouched by Western civilization, I think, at that time. This guy has an endemic goiter due to iodide deficiency, due to dietary iodide deficiency, common in far inland areas where marine food consumption is low. The people were very gracious. In 1982, rape clothing worn by young females in Shenyang signified they were unmarried. Kids around the world are curious and fun loving. In 1982, the streets were free and open in Kashgar. In 2021, they're not. This is a uh, euphemistically called on the right, the picture on the right is euphemistically called a Xinjiang Vocational Education and Training Center. It's really an internment camp operated by the Chinese Communist Party. And former Secretary of State Pompeo called this the stain of the century. It wouldn't surprise me if some of these young kids here are in this picture here. It's very sad. We had a bunch of physicians on the trip. We decided to visit a local hospital. They had no x-ray machine, no ultrasound, no blood pressure cuff, just the basic touch, feel, listen, and smell. This was the pharmacy. I wanted to buy a local a rug made locally. I went, went to the rug tent. I got out my credit card to pay for the drug I desired. The owner got out his abacus. That's when I knew the transaction might take a while. So now we're going to take a 120 mile bike ride from Kashgar up here to Mustagada down here. It's a bumpy bike ride along part of the Karakoram Highway, the historic Silk Road, a network of trade routes connecting the east and the west from Kashgar 4,100 feet elevation to Karakol Lake at 12,000 foot air elevation, the base of Mustagada. This is our overheated bus along the Karakoram Highway. This is the Karakoram Highway in 1982. In 2021, it's now asphalt from Kashgar to Abbottabad, Pakistan, 810 miles. It would make a good bike trip. This is the Karakol Valley at 12,000 foot elevation near Mustagada at a little or close to 25,000 foot elevation where we spent many days acclimatizing. Uyghurs are recognized as, as native to Xinjiang in Northwest China. They are one of China's 55 ethnic minorities now heavily discriminated against by China's ruling communist party. Most of us took Tiamox and Cetazolamide to lessen the risk of AMS. This is a side effect of the, that prophylactic medicine. Camels helped move our camp 10 miles from 12,000 foot to 15,000 foot over two days. We enjoyed local fare.
The food was scrumptious. Our liaison officer on the left of the Mountaineering Association of the People's Republic of China was very candid of his opinion of the CCP, Communist Chinese, Ch Communist China's P Party. He, his father had been a university professor back in the 60s. His father was taken out of the university and told to work in the fields with his hands. Uh, this uh, liaison officer had nothing but disparaging remarks about CCP. At approximately 15,000 feet, we met four climbers who said, two climbers in our party went up, but didn't come back. We left a tent at 21,000 for them. At 17.2, we came across a snow-blinded, dehydrated, weak and confused climber with frostbitten toes. He told us, we had bivouacked near the summit in a storm. My disoriented climbing companion left. I haven't seen him since. Once we moved the sick climber down to camels at 15,000 feet, we resumed our ascent and camped at 17,000 feet. Ski ascent began at 17.5. Steve McKinney on the right had broken the world record for speed skiing at over 200 kilometers an hour this same year of 1982. The three of us well, on the right, on the left is Bob Cedar Green. He was an anesthesiologist from San Diego. Three of us were chosen to go up to 21,000 feet to see if the missing climber skier was there. Here we're climbing up toward 21,000 feet on Mustagata to see if that missing skier was there in the tent left for, the, for him. We found the tent vacant except for a sleeping bag and a diary. We set up our camp three at this site. We then moved on up to 23,000 feet, set up camp four. Near the summit was very cold and windy. My thoughts this whole time, where is the warming hut? In the distance from the summit, I could see K2, the second highest peak in the world in Pakistan. At the top of the world, at the top of the mountain, we are all snow leopards. We had an enjoyable ski descent following our ski ascent. That was a world record for highest elevation at that time. But unfortunately, there was no sign of the missing climber skier. Beer never, never tasted so good. In Kashgar, the Chinese Mountaineering Association sponsored a celebration of our successful climb of Mustagata. I found the Chinese to be very formal, and they gave us this certificate of our climb. Also on the climb was Norman Croucher. He was a double BK amputee. BK means below the knee. In his 20s, he became intoxicated and fell asleep with his legs across a railroad uh, track. He lost both legs and then got his life together and started climbing mountains. He reached the Sun Mustagata and wrote this book, A Man and His Mountains. A few years after the climb, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. Life lessons on Mustagata in China in 1982. <clears throat> I am grateful to live in a democracy. Don't climb too high too quickly. Follow the guidelines for acute mountain sickness. I returned the missing climber's diary down in his tent at 21,000 feet to his family in Colorado. <clears throat> Four years later, uh, some friends called and said, would you like to climb the highest peak in Antarctica? I always have wanted to visit Antarctica for some reason. I said, sure. So we flew commercially down to Punta Arenas at the tip of Chile, and then with our 
least de Havilland to Winata, we flew across the Drake Passage to King, KGI, King George Island here, and then down on the Bell Bellingshausen, through the, over the Bellingshausen Sea to the Ar Argentine Air Force Base to refuel, not into Ellsworth Mountains where Mount Vincent was located 200 miles from the South Pole. Mount Vincent is named after Carl Vincent, prior US representative from Georgia, who is a key supporter for funding for Antarctic research. The Antarctic Treaty System original signers were Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Chile, France, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, UK, South Africa, Soviet Union, and the US. Mount Vincent's located in the Argentinian sector. I was preparing this talk about a year ago before uh, COVID-19 hit, and uh, which postponed the, the talk, and this presentation. And uh, I came across this article in this Journal of Science, published April of 2020. I found it very interesting because I highlighted that not only is ice mass decreasing in Antarctica, but it's in other areas, it's increasing, simultaneous, increasing and decreasing. This is the de Havilland to an honor we'd leased from a Canadian outfit in Punta Arenas, Chile before our flight to Antarctica. This is flying over the Drake Passage. King George Island, refueling, flying along the Bellinghausen Sea to the Argentina Air Force Base along the coast where we refueled. These are retractable skids on the wheels allowing us to land both on asphalt and on snow and ice. The Delhi penguins were frequent here along the coast. They're very cute. This is our first view of Mount Vincent, where we landed. The glacier is approximately 7,000 feet thick. If all glaciers on Earth were to melt, sea level would rise 230 feet. This is our Mount Vincent team in 1986. We ascended following the best guidance. Here we're going up 3,000 vertical feet and then back down and sleeping at our original uh, elevation and then moving the gear up 3,000 feet. So we're averaging 1,500 feet per day gain in sleeping elevation. You'll note the avalanche debris on this slope. Four major risks of high altitude climbing are cold, falls, altitude sickness, and avalanche. There's an avalanche over here, which is actually a huge one because there's a huge area. Uh, the distances in the space down there is unremarkably or remarkably large. Snow walls are important. They're worth the time to construct. Summit day, no wind. It was minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. It was sunny. The highest temperature on the trip was zero degrees Fahrenheit. Summit pyramid in the background. Top of the bottom of the world, 16,000 feet, 200 miles in the South Pole, 1986. This is the Argentinian national flag. Now, Havilland Twin Otter returned with a new climbing team who was ready to take us back to Chile. On that flight in was Reinhold Messer, pictured here, who had climbed Everest alone without oxygen. I asked Reinhold, why, why do you want to climb Mount Vincent? And he said, because he had just read about Pat Morrow being the first person in the world to climb all seven summits, the highest peak of each continent, he wanted to be the second to do it. Pat Morrow wrote a book called Beyond Everest, and it's a good, excellent read. 
So at this point, I had climbed Denali and Mount Vincent. There'd be five to go. I had some buddies with me on this Antarctic trip who had climbed a couple of these peaks. And so we talked and said, let's make that a goal for the next few years. And we did. Mount Elbrus is the highest point in Europe at 18,510. Elbrus is in Georgia. In 1987, the year we were climbing, the country was called Soviet Georgia. In 1991, Georgia gained independence from the Soviet Union. Elbrus is a dormant volcano in the Caucasus between Georgia and Russia. Ancient Arabs called the Caucasus 600 mile long chain of mountains that divide Europe from Asia Minor, mountains of a thousand languages. Romans, Persians, Arabs, Tartars, Turks, and Slavs all left their mark. Ascent partway on Elbrus was easy. We spent the first night at Priyat Hut called Typhoid Tower, for which reason we had, were careful with our hygiene, 64 miles in the Black Sea. Ascent from 13,000 to 18,000 uh, was relatively quick. Uh, it's, you can go up whatever amount of elevation you can handle, as long as you descend that same amount, uh, your risk of, of getting altitude sickness on a quick ascent is very low. Here I am at the summit, 1987, close to 18.5. I took the opportunity to wrap an American flag around a bust of Lenin. I found on the summit. Ski descent was quick and fun. What did I learn while climbing Mount Elbrus and traveling through Moscow and St. Petersburg to get there? In 1987, Russia was the first world military power with a third world economy. So we've done three of the seven. What's next? How about Punsak Jaya or Carson's Pyramid, located in Irian Jaya, highest peak in Austral Asia in the spring of 1990? Oops. Um, this is New Guinea, the island of New Guinea. This is Papua New Guinea. This is Irian Jaya right here. It's part of Indonesia. In, in 1623, Dutch explorer Jan Carstensen reported sighting of glaciers on this peak on a rare clear day. This is a cut people's attention because Carstensen's pyramid is on the equator. So it was, why would you see snow and glaciers on the equator? Uh, in 1962, it was first ascended by Heinrich Haar of seven years in Tibet fame. He had tutored the Dalai Lama in his younger years. It was under Dutch control until 1963 when Dutch relinquished control to Indonesia. The name was changed to Punsak Jaya, meaning Victorious Peak by the Indonesians. The interior is populated by indigenous people called the Dani. In 1990, the conflict between indigenous Dani and colonizing, colonizing Indonesians continued. What, what we were applying for a permit, we were getting lots of delays and uh, part of the delay was because the prior climbing group that the Indonesians had given permission to climb in Irian Jaya, they had been slaughtered by the interior natives. <clears throat> so um, on our, in our climbing group, we had a, one of my climbing buddies is Brian O'Connor, uh, he's become a lifelong friend since uh, our climbs together. His mother, he, we asked Brian if he'd asked his mother if she could intercede to see if either the Secretary of State at that time could get us permission to climb in uh, Irian Jaya to do Carson's Pyramid. And, and suddenly, we waited years, suddenly a per permit showed up after Jim Baker interceded on our behalf. So here, here's the American team, our team in Irian Jaya, joining Oswald Alls, a Swiss physician who had been waiting 20 years to climb Carson's. The Grossberg mine is adjacent to Karsten's Pyramid. It's the largest gold mine, second largest copper mine in the world. It employs almost 20,000 people, minority owned by Freeport McMoran, majority owned by the government of Indonesia. 
is a great book called The Conquest of Copper Mount by Forbes Wilson. If you're interested in geology, geography, adventure, it's, it's a wonderful read. After a one week delay, another delay, <laughs> we had lots of delays with Carson's Pyramid, it seemed. We are ready with the help of Freeport McMorrin and Tram to enter the interior of in Arian Jaya. Tram took us to 12,500 feet. From the top of the tram, we're on our way here to the base of Carson's Pyramid at 13.5. You look down, whoops, I thought I grabbed my mouse, makes the uh, slides advance. Um, this is, you can see how small our tents are compared to the peak here. Um, so this is base, this is clean limestone, great technical climbing. The peak is close to 16,000. We had to wait a few days to acclimatize, and then we waited too long and a snowstorm came in, which made climbing much more difficult. So when we finally got ready to climb, we start early in the morning, when it gives you more hours of daylight later with which to complete your climb. ground Oswald, Martin, and Pat had covered only two days before had nearly dried out. Brian was ecstatic. Probably had the prettiest summit day day that, that anybody's ever had on that mountain. And not to take away from Oswald's summit day, uh, I wish he had had as pretty a summit day as we had. summit ridge, the climbers had to negotiate many ups and downs on their way to the main summit. We caught a glimpse of Freeport's open pit mine beyond the north summit of the peak. gained altitude, the thin air started to take its toll. Luckily, the week they'd spent at base camp at 4,000 meters helped their bodies to acclimatize. I was 
very happy when I finally learned on my way back that all my American friends made it to the very summit of Carson's Pyramid. Okay, let's see you guys touch the tallest point in Australasia. We very carefully descended Poonsak Jaya. We are privileged to visit Chuika village, in the Balan Valley, home to the indigenous Dani people. Heinrich Haar wrote a book about his experiences with these same people called, I Come From the Stone Age. I recommend it to all of you. It's, uh, if you're interested in adventure, sociology, geology, geography, it's a great read. I'm gonna quote from Heinrich Haar, I Come From the Stone Age, uh, his book, uh, I Come From the Stone Age. I left my own solidly built home with its electric light, its hot and cold water, its glass windows, its comfort, and its security behind well-fitting doors. My aim was to journey to an unexplored part of an island where about 100,000 people live. People go to sleep when night falls, drink water from streams in their cupped hands, have never seen it through a pane of glass, don't know what a wheel is, and to continue in this day and age to regard a knife made of bamboo and an ax made of stone as the last word in man's technical equipment. They have no pots to cook in, no metal to forge, no cloth, with which to make themselves close, no wind written language to record their sm small store of words. They are good natured and playful. They are helpful as Samaritans. Their behavior is sometimes unpredictable and their cruelty set us aghast. These people are the Donnies of West New Guinea. The Donnie female is smaller than male, but hardly less strong. She was a loincloth which she weaves very expertly and attractively from fibers from the bark of trees from yellow orchids. The ends of her fingers have been amputated with a stone ax to help numb the loss of a relative. The amputation of ditches is a common practice among the Dani people. Males wear a penis gourd known locally as a kibowak, an outer rind of an elongated pumpkin-like fruit which they slip over the penis. The impetus for a pig roast. No matches, no lighters, only sparks from flint and dried moss twigs to start a fire. I was full after a meal of domesticated pig and sweet potatoes, their main crop. To an interpreter, they asked us if we would like to wear a kibowak. As their guest, we responded that we would be honored to. We did. What did I learn on the Carson's Pyramid climb? Asti, Asti, Bandar Ko Makaro means softly, softly, catchy monkey. So now we're going to the seven. Uh, Aaron, let's pause for a few minutes to see if there are any questions at this point in the talk. Great, Colin. There was a um, there was a couple of questions in the chat from Eric Hoffer in the class of '86. He was asking you if that was Jim slash Grim Wilson in the photo just before the slide of the certificate. That's, yes, but that was him. That's correct. And then Marge Davis from the class of 76 is, is commenting on how incredible your photos are. And she would like to hear a little bit more about your photo equipment and any challenges you might have had. The simplest of cameras, um, particularly on Everest, as you'll see now. Um, it, it was a Nikon camera, as I re recollect, because quite a few decades ago, these pictures were taken. Um, Kodachrome, Nikon, Kodachrome film, Nikon camera, somewhere telephoto. Um, I'm, I'm not a photographer professionally at all, or I don't consider myself a good photographer, but you take a lot of pictures and then you choose the best ones. That's, I, I, it's, that's what allowed the pictures to be particularly good at times is I took a lot and chose the best. 
I just made the comment in the chat, but if anyone has a question they want to put in the chat, they can, or feel free to unmute yourself and ask Colin directly. Colin, I'd like to follow up on the photo stuff. Zero degrees, minus 10 degrees. Did you not have to deal with shutters freezing or film that was just needed to be warmed up or nothing like that? I don't that? remember that being an issue. I just, okay. I don't, I, I just clicked away and, I mean, I kept the cameras in the tent at night. Uh, it was a little bit warmer, but during the day, it was in the pack. Uh, I don't think that was an issue for some reason. Maybe I was just lucky. Thank you. Colin, Judy Martin commented that she loves seeing the evolution of your gear, those good old wooden snowshoes in your <laughs> frame pack. Um, on one of the trips, we actually buried our snowshoes, <laughs> left them there. Now we use skis. <laughs> Uh, Colin, Christina Town from the class of 01 is curious on your thoughts on decks for pre preventing AMS, overused or underused? Yeah, I mean, uh, dexamethasone, I presume it's just, you're asking about it. Oh, I personally don't think it's the best drug to use. I think slower sin is better um, and Dimox is, is the better drug to use, I think. And then Bob Maldoon uh, is asking, did you ever meet Willie? Uh, I'm going to mispronounce the last name. Unsold. Uh, unsold. Yeah. I did not. Unfortunately, he died a few, uh, many decades ago in an avalanche. But he was, uh, I revered Willie. Uh, uh, I think he climbed Na Namna Devi with his daughter, Namna Devi Unsold. And on the peak, his daughter, as a 22 year old, uh, developed an abdominal ailment and died. Uh, really had summoned at Everest back in the early 60s. Um, I met Tom, the guy he climbed Everest with, the anesthesiologist from Seattle, Tom, can't remember his last name, but I didn't meet Willie. I, if I had had the opportunity, I would have taken it to meet him. I respected everything he did. Tom Hornbe Hornbeam, right? Yes, that's right. It's Hornbeam. Yes, that's correct. Hornbeam. I did meet Tom. I was doing an externship in Seattle, and I actually went over to the university and went to his office and met him. Yeah, got a great talk with him. I think it was he and Willie went up the west uh, ridge of, of Mount Everest. Only team that I have so far done that. I don't know if that's been repeated. Any more questions before we move forward? And feel free to continue to ask questions in the chat. We should have time at the end for Colin to address any, any questions about the second half of his presentation. Thanks, Erin. So uh, Mount Everest is of course located in the Himalayas, shown here. Like uh, this is the Xinjiang region of China up here where we find Muzdagata in this region. So you can see this whole area is K2 is kind of right here. Um, lots of high peaks indeed. Um, Karsten's Pyramid is down here in Aryan Jaya. We had gained permission to climb Everest, so a little over 29,000 for post monsoon in 1990. Well, we wanted to go pre monsoon, which is the pre preferred time to go because the avalanche risk is much higher post monsoon, but uh, all permits were, had been issued by the time we applied. We flew to Kathmandu, capital of Nepal, population 2.5 million. We visited a local hospital in Kathmandu. We only drank bottled water in Kathmandu. Um, one problem climbing post-monsoon is you're approaching the mountain in the monsoon, um, which means the airport at Lukla is fogged in a lot of the time. So you have to hike in 100 miles from near Kathmandu 
to uh, Lukla and then north up to base uh, to Namche Bazaar and up to base camp on Everest um, in the pre monsoon because it's after the winter and the in April, early April, the skies are clear, not much in the way of storms at that time. You can fly into Lukla and avoid the 100 mile hike in and all the too many to count leeches. This is our slides for pictures from our hike in through the jungle. So I want to ask about camera. It's, it's this unit here that uh, I and others used. Soon we were at Namche Bazaar, the Sherpa capital population of, Sherpa, of Namche Bazaar in 2001 was a little over 1600 people. While there, uh, a, a Sherpa male learned I was a doc and he grabbed me and he said, would you come to my Sherpa summer stone hut at 12,000 feet, a few miles away. My son has been, had diarrhea for many weeks. I think he's dying. I think his son was probably around a year of age. I said I would, and I did. And I evaluated him and treated him appropriately with antibiotics. Upon return after climbing Everest, I visited the same stone hut and fortunately learned his son re recovered, was better. <clears throat> they honored me with warm, unpasteurized yak milk. Back from Namche to Everest base uh, in four days. Again, not mindful of trying to do slow ascent so that you have less likelihood of getting mountain sickness. Buddhist shrines are frequent along the trail. It's a Buddhist temple, Buddhist monk. This is Alex Lowe spinning the prayer wheel for good luck on Everest. Tibetan Buddhism is the religion of the Sherpa people. Yaks are beasts of burden, also a source of food and fuel. The meat was tasty. This is Everest base at nearly 17,000 foot elevation. Sherpas are very religious people. They put these flags, these prayer flags over the um, camp to give us good luck on Everest. This is our team. This is an Everest bath. <laughs> so this is a uh, diagram of the climb. Down here we have base camp at 17,000. This is the Kumboys Fall. This is camp one at 19,000. Camp two advanced base at 21.5. Camp three on the Lutsi face at 24. Camp four at 26,000. And up here, Everest Summit. This is the actual Kumbu Ice Fall. Some people feel it's the most dangerous part of the climb. It's 2,000 vertical feet of jumbled ice. You start your climbs early in the morning as the uh, Kumu ice fall has less movement when it's cold or in the morning. This is a giant Serac. There are many of these in the Kumu ice fall, many in the size of box cars. And every couple of days the Kumu ice fall will move a couple of feet and some of these will fall over. And if you're around one of them, when they fall over your history. This is camp one at 19,000 looking to the Western Coombe where there are many huge visible crevasses. We are negotiating one with aluminum ladders. So now we're up at camp, we moved up to camp two, I would call it advanced base 
at 21.5. <clears throat> this is the Lotzi face over here. That's the South Call up here. Uh, because we were late applying for permits, all the permits have been used for the Lotzi face, which is the traditional route, the one that Sir Edmund Hillary used back in early 50s. All that was available to us was the South Pillar route. It had been climbed once before, and uh, that was the route we we're going to go up. It was very steep. This is climbing up the South Pillar route. This is Camp 3 on the South Pillar route at 23.5. Alex and I then fixed ropes above Camp 3 on the South Pillar route. Here we are at 25,000 feet, fixing, attaching ropes to the rock and to the snow and ice. This is a picture Alex took of me looking back down at the Western Coombe. And the Coombe Icefall is down here, base camp down there. Advanced base is just to the right of my left elbow. So this is, again, the South Pillar route. This is, in this area is our advanced base at 20 and, 20 and five. This is our, we have a camp up here at 23.5. Alex and I fixed ropes up to this point at 25,000, a little bit just below the South Cull. That night, an avalanche swept down the South Pillar route. Fortunately, nobody was up there. So we lost gear, but no life. We then paid money, meaning a bribe, to get, order, do the, get permission to climb on the Lhotse face. Now we're climbing the Lhotse face. This is South Cull abo above the summit of Everest up there. Looks like a nice day from the summit, no winds. This is the Jumar I talked about when I, I learned how to, about the use of a Jumar on Denali. See how it attaches to the rope and you can slide it up. And then if you fall, you lose your footing, it grabs the rope and prevents you from falling down the slope. Camp three at 24,000 feet on the Lhotse face. The Western Coombe down here, the Coombe Ice Fall down there. So this is the South Call, Everest Peak. <clears throat> storm clouds were moving in by afternoon. That's not a good sign. You don't want to be in the Lhotse face in a storm. It's avalanche prone, unfortunately. So we had to descend all the way down to base camp. where we were greeted with warm tea. This is a picture of Kathy and her husband, Alex A. Uh, on descent, her goggles fogged. She removed them and they were off her eyes for hours. And she developed snow blindness, which is a, a, a UV burn of the cornea, uh, sunburn of the cornea. The treatment is compressive patches. One week later, she was on the summit of Mount Everest. This is the Kumbo Icefall. So we had to reascend that. This is Lhotse Peak up here and the Lhotse face. Again, going through the Kumbo Icefall and its crevasses. We're up now at Camp 2, our advanced base at 215. This is Alex Lowe uh, doing some repairs on my ice axe. This is Lhotse Peak, oops, above us. This is the Lhotse face, South Call over here, 26. So we're approaching camp three at 24,000 Lhotse face. Camp, this is camp right there. But we bypassed it because we, we have, we're well acclimatized. Now we decide to go right on up to the South Call at 26,000. But if you notice, the summit has a plume off of it. That means the winds are high up high. Indeed, the next day, the winds were too high to climb Mount Everest. It was my birthday, my 43rd birthday, September 30, 1990. My son's birthday was the next day. I knew the history of climbing on Everest pretty well in the post monsoon. I knew historically, if no one had summited, 
Everest by October 1. Nobody would summit after October 1. So I felt our chances of making the summit were dim. And I wanted to call my son and wish him happy birthday. So I descended on September 30th, all the way down to uh, base camp to on the French satellite phone at $40 a minute and $1990, call my son on his 15th birthday, which I did, and he was quite thankful. While I was down there, the weather cleared, the winds uh, um, slowed down, and the group said, let's go back up. But Peter, a dentist from uh, California, uh, developed high altitude pulmonary edema, and he was able on, on his own accord to descend from 26,000 South Cull down to advanced base 21.5. We placed them in a the gamma bag and that for a few hours, that allowed him to gain enough strength that he could descend to base camp. <clears throat> While that was going on, the other climbers, my buddies were made it to the South Cull camp for the night. And the next day, they, this is a picture of this, our camp at this uh, South Call Camp 4. The next day they summited. So here's a picture of Dan and Alex on the last 300 feet. This I think the Hillary step right here in the summit up there in 1990. This is 2019. My question is, and probably it was like it in 2020 and 2021. Which kind of situation would you rather be in? 20, now or back then when you're climbing? It's a rhetorical question. Um, this is Alex Slow on the summit. Um, unfortunately, uh, in, uh, 10, in October of 90, 1999, Alex was swept away and killed by an avalanche in Shishapang with the only 8,000 meter peak holy within Tibet. That's the month of his death outside magazine before word of his demise had reached them, published this front cover picture of Alex calling him the world's finest climber. It's a sad day for me as Alex was a good friend and a terrific person. This is Dan Culver on the summit with Alex. Three years later, uh, Dan decided to climb K2. He was successful, but on the descent he fell and died. I, was, I, I got word of his death two days after his death. And a week later, I received this postcard from him. I'll read the last couple of sentences to you. Hope you're well and involved in all sorts of fun things. I send you fond thoughts, hugs Dan. I cried as I read this postcard. This is Everspace at 16.9, uh, where I was enjoying the warmth and more oxygen while my buddies were summoning. I heard about it on the radio. I said, well, my turn. They said, fine, but you have to go alone, Colin. The Sherpas are all spent, we as climbers are spent. I said, no problem. So I headed that day up through the Kumbu Icefall to advanced base at 21.5, slept. And the next day I went up the Lucy face to South Cole. Uh, Generously, Alex agreed to, offered to join me going to the South Call. And uh, at nightfall, this is our view of Chaoyu at, at another 8,000 meter, meter peak in the distance. <clears throat> at, when we got to the South Call, it was dark, it was cold, um, we had no oxygen. We got to our tent. Our oxygen bottles weren't there. Other teams from other countries had borrowed, euphemistically borrowed, I'll say euphemistically borrowed our oxygen. So here we are going around from tent to tent. It's dark, it's 26,000 feet, it's cold, very cold, trying to find oxygen. We found, th we were able to obtain three bottles for, in which I use one during the night and two for the next day, none for Alex. And the next day he took this picture and he said he's heading down and wished me good luck. I was privileged to be climbing alone on Everest above 26,000, looking into Tibet. 
I got to, after six hours of climbing, going at 300 feet an hour, to be a breath, eight breaths and a step, eight breaths and a step, uh, 300 feet an hour. So I got up to 20,000 by mid morning. I was the last person to leave because I got to bed late uh, because of the oxygen issue, tobacco. And um, so I was the last one to leave the camp. And so all these other teams were ahead of me. I caught up to four others <clears throat> at this uh, a, a horizontal uh, area about the size of your kitchen. And from there, I could look up and see the route ahead. It looked pretty straightforward to me. I could look into Tibet, see the glacial moraines. And a funny thing happened. There were four other people at this spot I'd caught up to. Uh, one was a fellow from South Korea, who I later learned had disobeyed his leader. And he was climbing without oxygen. Uh, and he had his shoe off, one of the boots off. He was trying to warm his foot. He suddenly fell back, he was gone. There was a guy from Belgium named Carl. He was coughing his brains out. He told me it was his third attempt on Everest. He wasn't gonna go any further. There was a couple from France in which I learned later, the woman was trying to be, she had no oxygen. She was moaning and crying, crawling on the ground. She was trying to be the first French woman to climb Everest without oxygen. Whereas her, I think it was her husband had oxygen. He came over to me and he said, he wanted my oxygen. I suddenly went, whoa. I was overwhelmed by the audacity, by his audacity. And um, I had promised Matt and Megan, I've shown here when we climbed uh, Mount Whitney in 86, <clears throat> I promised them I would not go past my comfort zone. And now the mountain wasn't going to push me past my comfort zone. Other weird human beings were going to. Um, so I decided to turn back. On my descent below the South Col, I looked up and there I saw a French father-son team on a paraglider, having launched from the South Col, having earlier summited, descending to base camp at 17,000. I was very envious. So what did I learn on Everest? At 20,000, trust your instincts. There are always other chances. So now I've cl I climbed or attempted five of the seven, now on to Aconcagua in 1993, the highest point in Western hemisphere located in Argentina. It's way down here. The Andes go from here all the way down to there. Aconcagua is right there near Santiago. It's actually in Argentina, but near the Chilean border. The Andes run along South America's western side. It's one of the world's longest mountain ranges of 4,300 miles of length. The Andes course through Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. Our team was small. Steve and Tyler Grace from Reno. Steve was a plastic surgeon at that time. His son Tyler was a student at Dartmouth. Myself and Robin, my wife, that was I can call behind us. Mules took our gear, but not us. The 20 miles from the highway at 10,000 feet to Plaza Mule is at 14.4. Then we became the mules. Good morning, I think. Yeah, good morning. Can you tell us what day it is and what's going on? What day is it? Friday, January 22nd. This is my wife, Robin. After one, so good afternoon. Tyler and I are taking a carry up to Canada. And that's it. I'm going to let you guys rest. It'll be better so I can get to the summit. You know what they say? A woman's place is on top. Which place is on top? It's a book titled that. These women who climb Annapurna. Uh -huh. The title of the book was A Woman's Places on Top. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, you're strong. You and Tyler are just strong as bulls. Good endurance, good outlook. Steve, could you help uh, Robin? Yes. How much do you think this weighs, Colin? Oh, 50.
What are we having for dinner? Coffee filters to get some of the silt out of it. We're in the company of uh, a Argentine uh, climbing club of some sort. Today uh, we headed off and uh, Tyler, Steve and I are up here to about the height of Mount. Onward and upward. How's it going, Fighter? Africa's what's left. Let's go to Kilimanjaro. Highest peak in Africa, located in Tanzania at a little over 19,000 in 2014. These pictures of wildlife, these few pictures ahead are, I give credit to my daughter, Erin. There's a wild African wild dog they're rarely seen. Two weeks prior to this trip, Aaron found out she'd been accepted early decision to Bates, class of 2018. That's our uh, eating tent. And in the foreground, our cooking tent. The guys are great for each meal. A good wash with soap and hot water. Lovely. The mess hall and Ravi, what are we having? Bread, potato latke, or latkes. Um, I think it's oatmeal in there. Tea, coffee, cocoa, and fruit. Aaron the ham. MC, the leader. Yeah, this is Kilimanjaro. The highest oh. mountain in Africa. Pulley, pulley. The highest freestanding mountain in the world. And the coolest people. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> yeah. 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 Happy New Year. Kilimanjaro. Wera, wera. 
This is the Alpine, Alpine uh, area. We started down the forest, and Heather, the moorland, and Alpine. You could have just as well have caused, called this Nevada. Camp at noon on the first day, January 1, 2014. Wilson set a beautiful pace for us. And Simon set up our tent. And we're golden, man. How you feel? How was the climb up? This is, uh, we left for the summit at 11 at night. This is the next morning at sunrise at the summit rim. What do you say, Rob? Pucky? Salut! Hakuna Matata! Hey, what do you guys say? Hey, Yeah, we are getting there. 10, 15 minutes to the top. What do you say, Funk? 10 to 15 minutes to the top. Yeah. <laughs> Summon of Kilimanjaro, January 2014, base class of 18 and 69. So hope you've enjoyed the my quest to do the seven summits. Let's bring the let's do the last few minutes, uh, bring it back closer to home. Sierra Nevada range, 250 miles long, running down the spine of California, has 249 official peaks worth climbing, according to the Sierra Peak section of the Sierra Club, located in the backyard of Reno, Nevada. If you wish to climb, I would recommend this. Book Trekking California by Paul Richens. Paul Richens is a very good friend of Robin and myself. We've climbed together for 35 years. Um, it's about summer climbing in the Sierra Nevada. <clears throat> it's mainly trails that would be easy trails. Um, and he, from uh, two day trips to one week trips, he goes over food, equipment, et cetera. I think it's a, it's a great uh, book to have if you wish to hike in the summer in the Sierra Nevada range. Uh, rating system for climbs, class one is walking, typically on a trail. Most of his climbs that he talks about are class one. Class two is difficult cross country travel. Class three, think of going up a steep, narrow staircase in the outside of a tall building without handrails. Class four, exposure is significant. Ropes and belay should come into use, fall likely fatal. Class five, technical rock climbing. <clears throat> I'll show you a few of these uh, climbs in the Sierra Nevada range. This is Mount Huxley at 13,000 on the John Muir Trail. John Muir Trail begins in Yosemite Valley. And 200, miles late, 200 miles later, it ends on the top of Mount Whitney. T it takes most people three weeks to climb it. This will be a third class route. Paul Richards is taking these pictures. Of Robin and myself. 
the summit block of Mount Huxley in 2008. This class two climbing with Aaron at age 10. We hike four days to get into the, this uh, uh, valley, um, pristine valley, where the air is in the summer, the air is in the Sierra Nevada range, the air is cool and dry. The sun shines a lot, the water is plentiful. This is a summit block of, of, of Eagle Scout Peak. To the left is a vertical drop of 2,000 feet. On this trip, Aaron discovered a fear of heights. This is Clyde's Minaret in the Minarets near Mammoth Mountain ski area, um, class four climbing. This is the summit here, Clyde's Minaret. We're gonna go over this, we're on the east side. We wanna, we're gonna ascend from the west side. We're gonna go this co here to get to the west side of Clyde's Minaret. We're now on the west side at this little lake. We camp the night. Next morning, we start off climbing. Is the peak up here. It's class four at this point, so we put on the ropes. This is Paul Richens leading. Here's the summit. Clyde's Minaret in 2014 at 12.3. I have in my hand a summit register. They're on those 249 peaks placed there by the SP SPS section in Los Angeles. And I've signed into 202 of those. Most of those, half of them in wintertime with Paul and other friend, Bob Carlson. This is the lake where we um, have our camp. The next scenes are from the west side approach to Mount Whitney, the highest point in continental US. I'd like to quote from John Muir in our national parks written in 1901. Climb the mountains and get the good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you, and the storms, their energy, or cares will drop off like autumn leaves. John Muir called the Sierra Nevada the range of light. So now we're just west of Mount Whitney at Guitar Lake and 11.5. The John Muir Trail leaves here and then ascends to Trailcrest at 13.5. Trailcrest is over here. This is a, sh a shot of the Whitney Ridge. This is Mount Whitney here, Mount Muir here. This is the east side of Whitney. Over here is the west side. This is Trailcrest. You go over here and then down here about 10 miles to Whitney Portal. Uh, from Trailcrest, there's two mile hike. I'll go back on this west side to the summit of Whitney and two miles back. So it's four miles round trip from Trailcrest to the summit of Whitney. You're hiking along a sidewalk, basically etched into the side of the mountain by workers decades ago. Along the way, there's a class three climb up Mount Muir that Robin took. Here she is on the top of Mount Muir, a little over 14. From here, you can see the summit of Whitney. And you can understand how steep the east side is, very gentle west side. John Muir Trail comes up here, zigzagging, and ends up here. She's signing into the summit register of Mount Muir. Here we have Bates 18, Bates 69, and a parent of 00 and 18 as well, atop Mount Whitney in 2008. 
<clears throat> Today, my children and grandchildren leave to retrace our footsteps from our 1986 climb of Mount Whitney with our two oldest sh children shown here back in 1986 atop Mount Whitney with the hopes our three grandchildren are accompanying us. We come Bates 27, 34, and 34. In the entryway to uh, the home of Robin and myself, west of Reno in Verdi, halfway between Reno and Lake Tahoe, we have this prayer, Navajo prayer. Beauty is before me, beauty is behind me, beauty is below me, beauty is above me. I walk in beauty. I'm sure this is on the minds of some of you watching this presentation. Why does anyone take the risks of climbing? I'd like to quote from Heinrich Carr and Pat Morrow. First time a car. Do you prefer firsthand experience to reading about it secondhand in books? Many people might like to, some people might want to, few people dare to. But this is a question of outlook and temperament and experience. Pat Morrow, first person of scale of seven summits, said in one of his books, at the core of mountaineering is our ongoing process of evaluation. One tries to determine the location of the line between the skills one has and the risk one faces. Too soon, nothing is gained. Too late, you've been reckless and die. I'd like to give congratulations to Bates Outing Club, 1920, 2021, Centennial Plus One, and thanks with BOC for starting me on my mountain adventures. Okay. Open, we're ready for questions. We have a question in the chat from Marsha who asked, as a physician, how did you manage your vacation schedule with the uncertainty of how long an expedition could take with unpredictable delays? I have forgiving partners, understanding and forgiving partners. The main partner was my wife. I had to be understandable and forgiving. And Eric Knight from the class of 90 asks um, your opinion on how global warming has impacted climbing. Uh, I, I don't I don't think it has yet, but I think if it continues, <clears throat> some of those glaciers will recede and it might make climbing more difficult on some of the higher peaks like Everest. Um, it's it's a concern. Um, how close to the Everest summit did Dr. Fuller get? And does he have any, it was obviously the prudent decision to make, but was there ever any bouts of regret over the decades? Y yes, there were bouts of regret. I, I always felt I would go back, but uh, my partners, my wife and my cardiology partners would not have allowed it, I think. But uh, there was regret and I'm not a person to regret too long. Uh, I've made the, I enjoy the climb alone from 26 up to 28, just me in a mountain. And I'm thankful I had that opportunity. And so what I dwell on is what went right rather than what went wrong. <clears throat> Can I share a quick uh, anecdote? So you mentioned you revered Willie Unseld. Um, yes. He lived in my neighborhood for a year in Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, he was the head of Outward Bound, or yes. working for, and um, so he lived four houses from, from me, and his daughter took me in the house, and on the ledge above the mantelpiece of the fireplace were his nine toes, Yes. And our formaldehyde, um, <laughs> black, and then as a 12 year old boy, it was in incredible to see. And then the next day to see him out kicking a football, I wondered how he could do it back then. But um, yeah. I'm sure, I don't know if you've read any of the biographies uh, of him or, or even the book about um, the loss of his daughter, which you alluded to climbing the yes. mountain she was named after. Yes. Um, Very sad. His wife uh, actually just recently published a a book about their life, which, uh, if you, I would recommend it. But a little 
one last little anecdote. And <clears throat> he made a, a, a joke, which I think only two people on the planet could make, Willie and Horn, Hornbein, who, as you mentioned, climbed the West Ridge, which I don't think has ever been done um, besides them. But <laughs> he and his um, charismatic humor referred to the, the Southern route as the, the milk run route. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard that uh, little quip of his, but thank you for I, listening. My pleasure. Yeah, I, I had not heard that, but I can understand him saying that. He did a very difficult route on Everest. Very difficult. When I'm climbing, I try and take the easiest route up a mountain. I, I, I'm not a, a, a brave person. I, li I like the easiest route up. Colin, thank you so much for today. You, you have lots of comments in the chat talking about how great this presentation has been and we will send them to you directly, but thank you for taking the time to do this today. Thanks very much, Erin. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.